Well, last week, Pastor Bailiff started us on a two-week look at an incredible chapter in the Bible, a two-week focus on Psalms uh, chapter 139. And last week, we looked at the first 12 verses in that psalm. This week, we're going to look at the last 12 verses in that psalm. So before we go on, I think it's important that we first review. Review what we learned last week because we learned two incredible truths about God that really lay the foundation for what we're going to talk about today. So if you were here last week, Stephen taught us some motions. We're going to have a little test. We're going to see who remembers the motions we learned last week. And the first thing we learned was that God knows me. Let's all say that together with emotions. Ready? God knows me. God knows us, which is an incredible, incredible fact. The next thing we learned was that God surrounds me. Let's say it together. Come on, every hand. Ready? God surrounds me. Very good. Both of those are incredible truths. See, when you look at Psalm chapter 139, one incredible thing about this passage is that it's very personal. I mean, the word me is listed in this psalm over 40 times. The interactions between God and David, me in this psalm are amazing. So when we read this psalm, it's a personal psalm. It absolutely applies directly to you and to me. The fact that God knows me, God knows us. He knows what we think, he knows what we say, he knows what we're going to do. God knows us. That's an incredible truth. And the fact that God surrounds me, that should bring us comfort in times of strife and difficulty, that we are surrounded by Almighty God. That brings accountability. Because knowing that God is constantly with us, surrounding us, we should strive to live in a holy way, to live in his ways. God knows us. God surrounds us. And we're going to look at some incredible things in that same passage, the second half of chapter 139 today. If you are able, I would ask, would you stand for the reading of God's word? Psalm chapter 139, verses 13 through 24, says this. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent, Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there will be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. You can be seated. We're going to look at a lot today. We're gonna go from creation to gestation, and then we're gonna have a time at the end of important self-evaluation. And my prayer is that God will do a mighty work in each of our lives today. God's power really is an amazing thing. I don't know about you, but I think the power of God is something that we take for granted. For me, I think I respect God's power sometimes the most when I'm in a beautiful scenic place. Does anyone else feel like that? When you're in a beautiful, you see something incredible and you just think to yourself, man, God really is amazing. Two specific times I can remember that happening to me. 
One, when my wife and I were in Hawaii, we were looking out at the beautiful ocean. We could see the other islands in the distance. And I just thought, man, God is incredible. Second time, when I was growing up, we were at Big Bend National Park, laying down at night, looking up at the stars, the clearest stars I've ever personally seen in my entire life. And looking at the expanse of the universe, I remember feeling so small in comparison to the mighty, huge God. God is a, he is powerful. He is an incredible God. And I looked up a few places that are world-renowned, beautiful, scenic places that I want us to look at today just to admire God's almighty power. First was this. In Positano, Italy, look at this beautiful city. Can you imagine being there on the coast? And maybe you visited this place. Just looking out at all of God's glory. In Machu Picchu, Peru, picture yourself standing on the mountains, watching the clouds move in and move out. The coast of Hawaii, a beautiful place that looks like something drawn by an artist, which it was, a divine artist. The northern lights in Iceland. I mean, how picturesque is that? How can you see that and not think someone or something, something almighty created that? It's gorgeous. The power of God, the fact that almighty God spoke the world into existence is an unbelievable thing. His power is seen all throughout his word. We see his power in creation we see his power when he flooded the earth. We see his power when he split the Red Sea. We can see God's power when he rises people from the dead. And we saw God's power when Jesus Christ himself rose again. Death could not keep him down. God is an amazing God and he is powerful. It's incredible to look at. And I paint this big picture of how incredible God's power is because... I think something that is unbelievable to you and me is the fact that that same almighty, powerful God who literally spoke everything into existence, created everything, he also created you. Let that sink in for a second. Everyone in this room, that same God created you. And that's our first point. We've learned that God knows me. We've learned that God surrounds me. But also, God created me. Let's say that together. God created me. What a special thing. And the reality is, God created all of us differently. We are all unique in our own ways. I can tell you by looking at me and my wife, Caitlin, her and I are drastically different people. We laugh at that sometimes. We, we make a great team in marriage because we are different in just about every single way. Our personalities, she is very detail-oriented. Every single hour of every single day of every single month has to be scheduled. I'm more of a, hey, let's just wake up and kind of see what happens kind of a guy. We're different. And that's caused some issues sometimes. There was one time in particular when I had first started working here at the Cypress campus we received an invitation in the mail. And it was an invitation to our staff Christmas party, just the staff over to, to Stephen and Tiffany's house. And on the invitation, it said down at the bottom in small print, tacky Christmas sweaters optional. And I read that and I looked at Caitlin and I was like, oh, we gotta do it. It's like, it's gonna be amazing. Now, I love a good tacky Christmas sweater. It's a great conversational piece. Caitlin, to be the center of attention, her absolute worst nightmare. So when I said, let's do it, tacky Christmas sweater, she looked at me and she said, absolutely not. I'm not wearing a tacky Christmas sweater. I don't even have one. And I was like, don't worry, I've got five. You can pick whichever one you want. I mean, I'm happy to share. She was like, no, I'm not doing it. We went back and forth and I was like, listen, you're gonna feel awkward when we get there and you're the only one not wearing a tacky Christmas sweater. How uncomfortable will that be for you? So finally she agreed. She said, okay, fine. I'll wear a tacky Christmas sweater. I don't have one, but we're gonna pick one up that's my size. I was like, okay, let's do it. So we swung by Walmart on the way to the party. And as we were searching through Walmart, 
It's Christmas season, so they were a little picked over. The only one we could find that was her size was this thick black cotton sweater that had the picture of like a gangster Santa on it. And it said the phrase, slaying them on top. I was like, oh yeah. I was like, this is the one. And she was like, I'm not wearing that. I'm like, you have to. Come on. And so she put it on reluctantly. We get in the car, we drive to this party, and when we, when we walk in and I kind of scan the room, to my horror, we are the only two people wearing tacky Christmas sweaters. And I could just feel her eyes burning into the side of my head. And I'm like, just don't look at her. I'm not even going to look. I'm just going to pretend like she's not even there. And I kind of socialized, went around talking at the party, and we met up about halfway through. And I was like, so... How's it going? And she looked at me and she said, Jace, every other wife here looks so beautiful. And I'm walking around with slaying them on my chest. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. That's, that's on me. And it's funny. We laugh about it now. In the car driving home, there was this moment where we were talking to one another. And Caitlin said, man, we are just so different in this. And I was like, I know we are. We are wired differently. The reality is God has wired each of us differently. He was intricately involved in your creation. That's, a, a, that's an amazing thing that he would do that. He created, as we see from the scripture, your frame. He's created your personality. Sure, certain parts of our personality are acquired through life experience, but there's parts of our personality that we are simply born with that God gives us as we are knit together in our mother's wombs. We are created unique and different. Let's read the scripture. Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Now, I don't know about you, but in reading these verses, I think undebatably, the first thing that jumps out to me is that unquestionably, we can see that life starts at the point of conception. That what happens in the womb of a mother is not a nuisance, it is life. And it's not just life, but it's God's creation. That same almighty God who created everything is intricately involved in the creation of everything every single child. That's an incredible thing. You can see this reiterated in Jeremiah 1.5. It says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. That is an amazing thing. The life, God's creation in the womb of a mother is something to be celebrated and something to be protected. Many of you know parts of Caitlin and I's story, but when we uh, when Caitlin was pregnant with our third child, Bryce, about halfway through the pregnancy, we were given some very interesting news. We were in for a regular ultrasound, and, and when they were looking at him, they said, hey, his femurs are short, and we think that he's going to have some major health issues. In fact, they told us there's a high probability that he's going to have some form of dwarfism, and we were kind of like, okay. And they said, also, there's this piece of tissue that's floating around in, in, in the womb, and there's a good chance that it could wrap around an arm or wrap around his neck. The, the life expectancy, the percentage of a chance that he actually makes it out of there is pretty low. So that scared us. So Caitlin went to see a specialist to confirm what the first doctor had seen, and, and they confirmed all of those things. So we don't know what life is gonna look like for him. And they asked her in that moment, would you like to terminate the pregnancy? And you know, dumbfounded even hearing those words, she obviously said no. 
no, we're going to keep the baby. And we came home, and, and it was a really, really difficult time. I, I'm proud to say that two weeks ago, we celebrated Bryce's third birthday, and he is 100% healthy. There's literally nothing wrong with him. He is short, that's true, but, but that's all. That inside of her womb wasn't an inconvenience, wasn't a nuisance, it's a life. I've seen it, I'm watching him grow. And that life is not just an incredible life, it's God's creation that he was intricately involved in knitting together. You get that picture. How special should that make you and I feel that we are part of God's creation? He played a hand in, in the creation of you. That's an amazing thing. Not just that, the passage says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I don't know who needs to hear this today, but here's an absolute truth. You are not an accident. You are not an accident. Regardless of the circumstance in which you came to this planet, whether your parents planned it or not, whether you know your parents or not, you are not an accident. God knew your frame. He knit you together. He knows your days. He has a plan for your life. You have purpose. Feel how incredible that is. God has a plan for you. Maybe you sit in here today and you would say, well, you know, Jace, I really struggle with self-image issues. I hate the way God made me. I think an argument is to be made that to hate the way you look is to hate God's creation. He created you. He thinks you are marvelous. He thinks you are wonderful. You are his creation, fearfully and wonderfully made, knit together by the creator of the universe, and he thinks you're incredible. And it actually gets even cooler than that. The scripture continues in verses 17 and 18. It says, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. David is astounded that the creator of the world, almighty God, not only played a part in his creation, but scripture says he thinks about us. How great are your thoughts about me? God is not some God that just created the world and said, well, we'll just see what happens with that. We'll check back in a couple thousand years, see what's going on. No, he is personal. God is not some God that knits someone together in their mother's womb and says, well, go on, live your life, and, and I'll check in on you later. No. Scripture says he thinks about you. Great are his thoughts about us. And not just every once in a while, not once a month, not, oh, I wonder what Bill's doing. No. It says his thoughts outnumber the sand on this earth. And that's a hard figure to figure out. Obviously, we don't actually know how many grains of sand on this, are on this planet, but I tried. And the closest number that I could get was 7 quintillion, 500,000 quadrillion grains of sand. How much sand is that? A lot. God thinks about us a lot. You should feel special. Why? Because the almighty creator who spoke the universe into existence, knit you together, has a plan for you, and he's not some distant God. No, he thinks about you. He cares about you. He loves you. Let's continue reading Psalm 139, verses 19 through 22. It says, Oh, that you would slay the wicked. Oh, God, oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? 
I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Now, this might feel like a kind of abrupt switch in the scripture. When I was reading it, you know, the first part of this is just like, God, you're amazing. You knit me together. You think about me, and I hope you slay your enemies. And I was like, whoa, take a breath, David. But I think this scripture says something really important. And the fact of the matter is, David is saying these enemies aren't just opposing him. No, he's saying these are God's enemies. And David sits there in such awe with such adoration for how amazing God is. He says to him, your enemies are my enemies. He has so much love, adoration, and awe for God that he has zeal for God's honor. He's saying, if you're against them, I'm against them. If it's evil to you, it's evil to me. I am with you. And then he closes this psalm with this incredible, incredible prayer. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. From this passage, we've learned that God knows me. God surrounds me. God created me. And the last point is this. God, search me. Let's all say that together. God, search me. And you may hear all those points and think, well, shouldn't it be God searches me? That would would kind of put a bow on all of the points. He knows me, he surrounds me, he created me, he searches me. But no, I say God searched me for a reason because this last part of the psalm is so personal. And it's this individual prayer that David cries out to God with. And I would say this, over the next few minutes as we talk about this prayer, I think all of us would benefit from taking a spiritual inventory. What this prayer meant to David, what does it mean to you? If you would pray this prayer the same way that David did, how would that drastically change your life? I want you to think about that for just the next few minutes. How would this prayer change the trajectory of my life? Let's look at it. Let's break it down. First thing he says is, search me and know my heart. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Don't you know that we are all born with a bad heart? We are all born with a sinful heart. We are all born with the tilt to do wrong things. But the heart, not only is it born sinful, it's deceptive. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things. The heart can deceive you. But what does that mean? How does, how does the heart deceive me? What is it that you're struggling with in your life? Maybe you, you, your heart would say, listen, I'm not a liar. I don't lie. Just the truth would just hurt if people heard it. That could be your heart deceiving you. Listen, I'm not lustful. I don't lust. I just really appreciate God's creation. That could be your heart deceiving you. I'm not prideful. I don't struggle with pride. I'm just a born natural leader. That might be true, or it might be your heart deceiving you. I'm not a glutton. I'm not obsessed with food. I just, I just, I I really appreciate the craftsmanship of an amazing dish. That might be your heart deceiving you. The heart is deceitful, and David stops and prays, know my heart. If you were to stop and pray today, God, search my heart. The things that he might reveal to you could radically change the way you're living for the better. Think about that. What would God reveal if you asked him to search your heart. Next thing, he says, try my thoughts. See, we know that God knows me, so it's more than just my actions. Yeah, I might be struggling with this, or my heart may be leading me to do this. What are you thinking? 
God knows your thoughts. He knows what's happening up here. In some translations, it says anxious thoughts. What are your fears? God knows that. What's preventing you from doing his will in your life? Where do you lack trust? Know my thoughts. If you were to sit here and not just say, God, search my heart, but you would also say personally for yourself, God, know my thoughts. What is it that he would reveal in your life? Then the next part of this prayer, the next thing he reveals is this. It says, see if there is any grievous way in me. See if there's any sin in me. Uncover my sins. What if you were to ask God to do that today? God, search my heart. God, know my thoughts. God, reveal the sins in my life. And not just some of them, not just the ones we're comfortable revealing, all of them. About a month ago, there was an altercation in my house between Bryce, my son, and Mackenzie, my middle daughter. And I was sitting in the living room, and and I hear Mackenzie screaming, Dad, Dad. So I turn around, I walk over to Mackenzie, and I'm like, what? What happened? And she said, Bryce hit me and stole my popsicle. So I go, okay. So I go find Bryce. I'm like, let's address this. Son, did you hit your sister? And he looked at me, three years old, and he says, yes. And I was like, do we hit girls? No. You should never hit your sister. Your job as her brother is to protect her, not hit her. Go tell her you're sorry. Okay. He went and said, I'm sorry. And then I said, hey, did you take her popsicle? And he looked at me and he said, no. He had chocolate all over his face. Everywhere, It was on the floor, it was on his shirt, it was on his face. And I was like, are you sure? And he was like, no, 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 I didn't eat the popsicle. I'm like, oh, okay. See, he was willing to admit one sin that he definitely knew he shouldn't do. Yes, okay, I hit her. I know I shouldn't hit my sister. But I might want her popsicle again one day. He wasn't quite ready for that one. Don't you and I do that in our lives as well? We're ready to admit certain sins and say, God, work with me there. But do you have a sin in your life that has such a tight grasp on your life that you're not even willing to admit it to God? God, I'll stop doing this, but I don't know if I'm ready to let this go. Or are there certain sins in your life that you won't even talk to him about because you're embarrassed for God to know about it? He already knows. What if today you would say, God, search my heart. God, test my thoughts and reveal the sin in my life and not just the sins I'm comfortable talking about, but also the ones that I'm uncomfortable talking about. Reveal those to me. Help me to work through those. Why? For this last part, the last part of the prayer. So so you can lead me in your ways everlasting. Lead me in your ways. What does that look like? If you were were to ask God to search your heart, to test your thoughts, to reveal the sin in your life, and then to lead you in his ways, that might mean a drastic change. That might mean standing up for your faith at work. That might mean an uncomfortable conversation with a neighbor. That might mean no longer watching the things you used to watch. That might mean no longer drinking the things you used to drink. That might mean no longer parenting the way you're parenting. That might mean being a better spouse than you're being right now. What if we all ask God to search our hearts, test our thoughts, to reveal the sin in our lives, and to lead us in his way? How radically and drastically would that change your life and mine? In an incredible way. And that's what David does. He prays this prayer. He's just talked about these evil wrongdoers and he's saying, God, I don't wanna be one of them. I don't wanna be against you. I wanna be with you. So we're gonna do something different today. I want everyone to close your eyes, bow your heads. We're gonna pray through this prayer. 
If you are so bold to let God do business with you today, to work in your life, I would ask that in your seats, I'm gonna read it line by line, if you would repeat after me. You can do that out loud, you can do that in your heart, in your mind, but let's boldly pray this prayer that David prayed and see if God won't do something amazing in our lives. Repeat this after me. Say, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen. A powerful prayer. What if God does something amazing in your life? What if after taking a spiritual inventory, you say today is the day that I'm no longer living the way I used to live. I want God to lead me in his ways and I wanna do something amazing for his life. What if that started right now for you? Psalm 139, God knows me. God surrounds me. An incredible truth. God created me, but leaves us with a challenge. God, search me. Know my heart, my mind, my sin. Lead 